they did permit the use of weak hadiths in what they called fada'il al-a'mal. Fada'il al-a'mal means virtuous deeds. Meaning, this wasn't a weak hadith which was bringing some principle which was new to the religion and something which didn't exist. Like Salat al-Hajjah. Salat al-Hajjah, Dua al-Hajjah, which is there. They tell you make two rak'at, there's this big long dua to make. It's not authentic. It is not authentic. It's in Fazail al-Amal. Tabligh al Islam is there. It's not authentic. Now, that hadith is promoting a practice, a particular religious practice, Salatul Haja, which is not authentic. We cannot work with that at all. Now, a hadith which says, if you do tahajjud 10 nights in a row, Allah will give you a tree in paradise, for example. Now, doing tahajjud is something already a part of the religion. And if you did two, 10 in a row, it's good. So if there was a hadith which said this, and it was da'if, not because there was a liar in the chain, some scholars permitted using it in this area because it's not introducing a practice which wasn't there already, but only offering reward for a commendable practice. That's all. Some scholars permitted it. And these tended to be the fiqh scholars right, who rationalized this. Whereas the hadith scholars, well, they didn't want to use hadith da'if at all. They took a more rigid position. So, Fabrications, we said, first category was that of false piety. People out of their piety, feeling that people were turning away from the Quran, fabricated hadith about the Quran. There's another individual called Maisara ibn Ab Abdi Rabbi, about whom Ibn Hibban collected a narration from Ibn Mahdi in which he said, I said to Maisara ibn Ab Abdi Rabbi, where did you get these hadiths? Whoever reads such and such will get such and such a reward. He said, I made them up to attract people to do righteous deeds. Right? This was his intention. Right? And the other individual we talked about, Nuh, right? Ibn Nuh, he made up hadiths about the Quran. As I said, unfortunately, we do have people, even till today, who will use this, justifying, right, that what they're doing was for the sake of Allah. Where, for example, you get in a discussion with a non-Muslim, right, and they're asking you some questions and you're jammed up. So you say, well, the Prophet Sallallahu did this or he said, really, he didn't do it, nor did he say it. But by you saying that, you protected Islam from this attack. You defended the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, something like this. Now, the ends may seem to be a good end, but the means you've used are illegitimate. So, such a practice is not permissible. Is it or is it not permissible to offer Salat al Hajjah? It is not permissible. I mean, this is clear. The second category 
or, or sources for fabrication was sectarianism where you had groups break off from the main body of Islam the first of which were the Khawarij whose descendants rule Oman the main uh, people of Oman maybe 60% of them are what they call Ibadites or Ibadiyya they follow the Ibadi Madhab this is a, an extension from the Khawarij the first group to break off from mainstream Islam and the Shia these groups as they broke off deviated in order to legitimize their positions people among them began to fabricate hadith right? huh? well they, they broke off in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib it was during his Khilafah during the struggle between himself and Muawiyah and you know, the Khawarij broke off and uh, the Shiites, the Khawarij broke off and they declared Ali to be a Kafir, a disbeliever. The Shiites, they went to the other extreme. They elevated Ali and gave him some of the attributes of Allah. In that early generation, some of them went to great extremes, claimed he didn't even die. And that the thunder that you hear is his voice. And the lightning that you see is the flashes from his sword. <laughs> anyway, the point is that uh, people fabricated hadith to support their deviation, whether it was about qadr or destiny, or it was what they call irja, you know, those who believe, felt that belief was just in the heart. Once you believe, nothing can harm your belief. You know, deeds don't matter. This is like the Christians, modern day Christians. That look like that is a deviant irja, it's a deviant belief. And deeds are inseparable from faith. And uh, the Shiites are very famous, actually, for it. They've, uh, in their modern Shiaism, you know, they have a celebration called Ghadir Khum. Ghadir Khum. They have, it's, a, it's a day of celebration for them. And Ghadir Khum is one of their biggest lies, right? which they fabricated in order to promote the idea that Ali should have been the Khalifa after Muhammad Sallallahu Now, when Prophet Sallallahu and his companions were returning from Mecca after the Hajj and they were going back to Medina, they stopped at a place called Ghadir Khum. Ghadir meaning a pond, the place called Khum. They claim that when the Prophet ﷺ stopped there, he set up a tent. He set up a tent. And he had Ali go inside of the tent. And he told all of the companions there, you know, 10,000 out of them, that Ali was to be the Khalifa after him. And the companions made an oath of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ and to Ali to uphold that, beginning with Abu Bakr, then Omar, then Uthman, and so on and so on. That's what they claim. So, according to them, then, when the Prophet ﷺ died, these leading companions, Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman, they conspired to steal the Khilafah from Ali. And in doing so, they both to Allah, which then made them, in the eyes of the Shiites, apostates. And they left Islam. So you'll find in their writings where they claim that the vast majority of the Sahaba, except for five, or some say three, the rest of them all became apostates. All of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, his wives, his, his wives, 
with the exception of Khadija. Everybody else, Aisha, you know, Umm Salam, all of these people were apostates. Okay? And only Prophet Muhammad you Sallallahu know, the only people who remained on Islam were the Prophet Sallallahu and Fatima and uh, Ali, Hassan and Hussein, you know, this is the core. Right? They even reject and deny even the other daughters of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like Zainab, etc. Anyway, <clears throat> the point is that they have a number of stories like this. And you'll find them in their books where they try to promote, you know, Islam, their version, if you say, their Shiaism at the expense of Islam. And they will claim that these narrations are all found in our books, you know. And sometimes they will mention Bukhari, and the point is they have another Bukhari amongst themselves. So when they use Bukhari, you think it's Bukhari, you go to our Bukhari, you don't find it in there. And it's a Bukhari they have. They have their own Bukhari. <laughs> so they employ a variety of different uh, techniques, you know, devious techniques to promote uh, these ideas. <clears throat> the third category is that of bribery. Bribery. That is, that there were some individuals who, in order to gain favor amongst the rulers, fabricated hadiths about them and their families. You had people who did this. And they, of course, you know, because amongst the Abbasid rulers, etc., you know, they did give awards to people for writing things. So somebody came and he put made a hadith about them, how great they were in their family and this, that, and the other. And they gave them some awards, some prize, but what they conveyed was something fabricated. So you did find people are doing this. And this is why the uh, major scholars, they avoided being in the courts of the, these rulers because of the corruption which was taken there, placed there, either through the f use of fabricated hadiths or people were involved in a variety of other practices. You know, whether it was you know, magic, magic, or astrology, or music, all these kind of things that become popular in the courts of the Abbasid rulers, and even amongst the Umayyads in the latter period also. <clears throat> so, uh, this became a source of uh, fabrication. There's another source, which could be looked at as being a subheading under sectarianism, and that is uh, fanaticism towards the madhab. That you did find some, when, when, the, when the, the um, feelings of madhab fanaticism had reached a peak, where people, you know, you had a point where they built masjids with two mihrabs, one for the Hanafis and one for the Shafi's. You can still go to Syria, Damascus, and see mosques which still have the two mihrabs there. They used to have two different prayers. If the, the town was half-half, they would have two different prayers. Fajr, the Hanafi Imam would leave. After he's finished, then the Shafi Imam would stand up and leave. They had two different mihrabs, and Hanafis would pray behind Hanafis, and Shafis would pray behind Shafis. It reached this, this kind of stage. So much so that around the Kaaba itself, they built structures around the Kaaba. They called maqamat. The maqam for the Hanafis, maqam for the Hanbalis, maqam for the Shafi's, maqam for the Malikis. Okay? And when the time for prayer came, they would have different Imams, you know, would lead the prayer. All those people who were making tawaf, who were in the haram, you know, who were from that madhab, they would line up behind them, and they pray behind them. If you look at the old pictures of the Kaaba, you would see these structures around it. That's what they were. And this continued all the way until 1925 when the uh, family of Saud with the family of uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab together they took over Saudi Arabia, they went into Mecca and they tore down all of these structures. And when they did it of course the Muslim world screamed. What are these people doing? Desecrating our you know, holy place. And they were really purifying it. And they at that point appointed one Imam and they said everybody had to pray. But up until 1925 there were four different prayers going on around the Kaaba each time, for each prayer time. We still have remnants of that. 
in places where Hanafis and Shafi'is live. Right? I've seen it in Singapore, I've seen it in Malaysia, in the Philippines, it exists in different parts of India, Sri Lanka, where you will come into the masjid and they'll have a, a prayer times and then they will, for Asr specifically, yeah, there will be a Shafi'i time and a Hanafi time for Asr. So these are leftovers from that era. Anyway, in order to promote the madhab, you had some people make up, fabricate hadiths saying that the Prophet ﷺ predicted the coming of Abu Hanifa and predicted the coming of a Shafi'i. You know, this is where most of the fabrication came around these two because they became the, the, the schools that were in the greatest level of rivalry. Maliki was sort of swept aside. Hanbali had almost gone out of existence. <clears throat> so you found people, as I said, fabricating in support of this. Or people who are into the madhab themselves very strongly. There is an individual by the name of Hussein Ishik from Turkey. He wrote a number of books, very strong into madhab. One of the books I remember reading, he quoted a hadith in there that uh, when the angel uh, come to you in the grave, Munkar and Nakir, and they ask you, you know, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? Ma Dinuk, what is your religion? Man Nabiyuk, and who is your messenger? They will also ask for Ma Madhabuk. <laughs> what is your mad what was your madhab? He quotes it in there. This is a fabricated hadith. Has no chain, you'll not find it even in any books of hadith at all. Completely fabricated. You know, to promote the idea that you must follow a madhab. And another fabricated hadith they, they also like to quote is that if you don't follow an imam, then shaitan is your imam. Another uh, fabricated statement which they try to promote this idea that you must follow a matter. But the simple answer to this is what was the madhab of the sahaba? This is a simple answer. Were they Hanafis or Shafi's? What were they? Of course, there were none of these things. These madhabs didn't show up until two generations after them. Okay, so obviously they were they did not follow any of these madhabs. So obviously it is not a requirement for a person to follow any madhab because their way was the best way. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that that path to paradise, the correct path, which is free from deviation, is the path that I am on. And you are on. Right? When he talked about the 73 sects, saying 72 of them are in hell except for one, and they asked, well, which one is that? He said, the one that I am on, and you are on. And none of them were Hanafis, Shafi'is, Malikis, or Hanbalis. Okay? So this says that it is not a requirement. Hmm? Doesn't mean you cannot follow a school of thought, because the school of thought is the product of scholars, Muslim scholars of the past, who sought to apply Islamic law in circumstances according to various needs. And a scholar who comes from that school is a scholar. And if that's what's available for you, you get knowledge from him. But the point is that you are not obliged, nor should you follow him blindly. Because all of the founding scholars of these various schools of law, they all told their followers if you find an authentic hadith, then that really is my madhab. They all told them in one way or another the same statement. They discouraged people from following blindly. And they studied under each other. Okay? Imam Shafi was a student of Imam Malik for some 20 years. Imam Ahmed was a student of Shafi. So, you know, they were students of each other, the students of Abu Hanifa studied under Malik and you know, so on, so on, so on. So the point is that we should not be rigid about issues of madhab. One may follow scholars from the madhabs if one wishes. And one should not insist on it. <clears throat> the uh, fourth... Uh, wow. Well, all right.
online uh, questions here. I'll just complete this. The fourth uh, reason for the fabrication was also those individuals who opposed Islam but were not able to do so openly. So they tried to oppose it from within. They pretended to become Muslims and they opposed it from within. One of the methods was fabrication. One of the famous fabricated statements of theirs is the hadith, so-called hadith, where Allah, it's supposed to be hadith Qudsi, where Allah says, I was a hidden treasure and I wanted to be found. So I created the world. It's the purpose of creation. That Allah wanted to be found, He wanted to be known. This is from Gnostic uh, thought. And the purpose of creation is to know Allah. Intimate knowledge of Allah. Or the other fabrication that were it not for you, O Muhammad, this is a hadith Qudsi supposedly, I would not have created this world. So the purpose of creation was for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the other fabrications of the Nur al-Muhammadi, the Muhammadan light. Huh? That when Allah was without anything besides himself, or just Allah, a light shone from him, his light. And from that light, the soul of Muhammad was made. And the Shiites say that light split into two parts. <laughs> one was Muhammad the other one was Ali. <laughs> and from this light the world was created. So and so. So those who sought to destroy Islam from within, they invented a hadith which brought into Islamic teachings uh, teachings from the uh, various other religions. Or they attacked the prophethood, like for example, there was a hadith which was narrated, so posted hadith narrated by Muhammad from Anas, and the Prophet had said, I am the seal of the prophets, no prophet will come after me except if Allah so wills. And there's correct narration, and I am the seal of the prophets, and no prophet will come after me. That is the correct narration. But this individual, Muhammad, added to it, except as Allah wills. See, big implications for that. Meaning that it is possible if Allah wills it that another prophet could come after Muhammad sallallahu And of course, the people like the uh, Qadianis, they love that narration. Okay? Because it supports their belief that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was a prophet who came after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> Okay, that basically completes our presentation on the fabricated or rejected hadith. Um, you have a bunch of questions here, and our time is also late. So, uh, what I'll do is I'll just try to quickly run through those which are related to the topic. Uh, sorry, sister, who gave me about 15 questions on the topic. We'll have to save them for another time. Maybe our last session on Wednesday. Is there a surah which is recommended to be read according to Sahih Hadith? Yeah, there are a number of surahs. You know, surah Al-Ikhlas, for example, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it's equivalent to a third of the Quran. Surah Al-Mulk, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said that one who reads it, it is protection from the punishment of the grave. Uh, surah Al-Kahf, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recommended reading it on Fridays, and so on. Or Al-Waqi'ah, there are surahs which Prophet Sallallahu did recommend. <clears throat> so many people say that Ibn Saud, etc., his family, I guess, were puppets of the British. Is this true? Or were they just following, or were they just following just a part of Islam? Well, the Saud family, basically, what they came with was a call to coming back to Islam as it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That was the bottom line. If you look at the message, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, 
I mean, what he taught, what he wrote, etc. It is all about following Islam as it was written. However, because at the time that he was calling to these things, people were so much involved in bid'ah and innovation, what he called to appeared to them to be itself innovation and bid'ah. So they labeled him an apostate. You know, so a Wahhabi became a synonym for deviant and apostate. But in fact, if one goes and reads the writing, the books that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab wrote, they are calling people to practice Islam according to the Quran and the Sunnah as it was understood in the time of the Sahaba. And so those who download the prayer unto their heart, do they have any authentic hadith? What, what is download the prayer unto their heart? I mean praying with their hand over the heart. No, there is no had authentic hadith to support it. Surah Yaseen, to read this to a sixth person, is this advisable? Well, if you are doing it believing the false information concerning Yaseen, it is not advisable. But if you read it as a chapter from the Quran, among other chapters from the Quran, which uh, a person may read as a means of helping people remember Allah, right? Then it is perfectly legitimate to read it as it is legitimate to read any other chapter from the Quran. Right? Well, we know that Prophet ﷺ did say, uh, he said, Laqinun mautakum la ilaha illallah, that we should tell those who are dying to repeat after us, La ilaha illallah. Let that be the last word that they say before leaving this world. Now, some people misunderstood this because it says, Laqinu mautakum. Literally, it says, uh, Get your dead to re your dead to recite La ilaha illallah. So, even after the person is dead, they're still saying to them, la, You know, La ilaha illallah. They're carrying the body of you, still saying, La ilaha illallah. Say La ilaha It's finished. It is the people who are dying, not the dead. You know, this is of no benefit. Is a girl allowed to visit the graveyard? Yes. It is permissible for women to visit the graveyard, but they should not do so frequently. Yesterday he quoted a hadith of Aisha to whom the Prophet said, if a girl reaches puberty, or it's actually asma, right? Hadith of asma, right? Anyway, a girl reaches puberty, uh, she should not expose anything but her face and hands. Can I? Uh, can you tell where this hadith is from? Is it from Bukhari or Muslim? No, it is from Abi Dawood. Why do the scholars have different opinion amongst themselves on this hadith? That is when this hadith is Hassan Ligayri. Well, uh, on my website, uh, I have uh, translated an article by Sheikh Masud Din Albani in which he lists the arguments against it. And what is the basis of those arguments? Yeah. And uh, if you want to read about it, you can go there and read the, the whole argument. But what it is basically is that uh, some people have taken a position that the covering of the face is wajib. Okay? And to maintain that position, it is necessary to insist that that hadith of Asma is not authentic. That's the bottom line. But in terms of the evidence, the evidence is there. And besides that, we know the hadith of Fadl ibn Abbas, a very clear hadith, where Prophet Muhammad is sitting on his camel during the Hajj, because he rode the camel through the Hajj. Fadl ibn Abbas is sitting behind him, and a woman uh, gets up and asks him some questions. And whilst he's answering the questions, he noticed she is looking at Fadl, and Fadl is looking at her. Right? So what he did was he turned Fadl's head. And after turning Fadl's head, his head came back.